Yeats once said that if we dream the dream long enough, we create the reality. And that is what the encyclopedia is. It's a dream realized. The Center for the Study of Southern Culture was unmade when I came here. And that was the exciting part about it because there were no precedents, there were no traditions, there were no ways that things were done. We started in 81. That's when we hired Charles. He came in 81 and we finished in 89. So it took, you know, Bill said, oh, we'll do this in a year or two. And that's always the way Bill was. He was and is so optimistic. The center and Oxford and we were, were breaking new ground here. There was some risk involved. There was great risk involved. Well, we knew it was going to be important, but uh, I did not realize how important it would be. I ran into Matt Hodgson, who was the director of the University of North Carolina Press. I said, Matt, this is a great thing you're doing. This is wonderful. He said, yes, yes. He said, we feel, uh, we, we feel it's a very important book, and we feel it's our duty to publish it. Of course, we're going to lose money on it, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> no. Sue Hart, my assistant, whom I love dearly, called herself my hair shirt. She was a radical, outspoken woman, and she was a librarian. And she said, if we're going to study the South, we should create an encyclopedia of Southern culture, which will force us to study every aspect of it. We have a lot of Southern manners uh, in those days at the center, but Sue got beneath that in her own way, not to be unmannerly, but to pierce little probe a little deeper, and that was vital as we put together this encyclopedia. When we cast a wide net with the encyclopedia, we embraced three disparate bodies of culture. The classic canon of literature and art and music, the popular culture of television, radio, the media, and the folk the vernacular voices of storytellers, quilt makers, blues singers. And that was a controversial approach. It took us three years to get the project funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities because the scholars were not comfortable with that. One scholar commented on the fact that we had the audacity to put uh, Dolly Parton and Eudora Welty in the same book together. From the beginning, the goal was to try to set an agenda for a new way to think about the South. Not just about where we had been, but where the South was going. We went to see my friend Howard Lamar, a Western historian at Yale who grew up in Alabama, a dear friend, and he had edited the Encyclopedia of the American West. It was the closest thing to what we wanted to do. He said, I did the whole thing myself. That's too much. The four of us read everything. We had a lot of correspondence with all the people who were contributing to the 24 major sections and then other people who were writing the articles for each of the sections. And we got the very best scholars in all of the fields who then enlisted their colleagues to write so when you looked at that six and a half pound volume, you knew with authority that every piece in it had been done by someone who knew that field uh, intimately. It was very important to me at the time that I was asked to participate in the Encyclopedia of Southern Culture project because it made me feel like I was a part of a much larger community of scholars and, and, and students of Southern Culture. The very fact that they were including topics on American Indians and on American Indians outside of Indian removal, I thought was, was really remarkable. And I wanted to know these people. It is the kind of publication, even if it had been a little less imaginative, a little more pedestrian than it was, it would still remain useful. But because it had a kind of verve behind it, 
it's remained both useful and interesting to people beyond scholars who are looking something up in it. That point between having scholarly authoritativeness and uh, reliability and also reaching popular audiences, it was not a given. We had to figure it out and almost day by day. And one of the things you get when you think about the encyclopedia is that sense of abundance, the richness and the beauty that has been produced by people from this region. I grew up on moon pies, and Dolly Parton, seeing her in an encyclopedia, in some sense, validated my own cultural upbringing. I bought you know, 15 or 20 copies over the first few years. I was giving it to everybody for graduation presents and wedding presents. And, you know, it was something that every house, Southern household should have, was the way I felt about it. And a lot of other people felt that way too, apparently. We decided that we would have the day of publication in Washington, D.C. Bill wanted to have a big bang, and so did the Chapel Hill. The Encyclo Party was unique to Oxford. Lisa Howorth and her husband Richard organized a book party that would take over the square, and each of the writers who could come was encouraged to dress as the topic that they had written on. So two people dressed as kudzu. Lisa gave me an Elvis outfit. I dressed as Elvis. It was just unbelievably exciting and strange. We saw how the ESC, as we call it, had begun to move into the hands of journalists, and it shaped the way that they were writing and thinking about the South. There was nowhere that the encyclopedia wasn't featured. The Chicago Tribune did a big story in their Sunday magazine, and they had their cartoonist uh, do a wonderful drawing. But it was of people sitting on a front porch talking and evoking that Alex Haley preface. Can you remember those southern elder men who just sit on their favorite chair? Chair or bench for hours every day. And a year later, later they, they could, could tell, tell you at about what time of day someone's dog had trotted by. And the counterpart, elderly ladies. Their hands deeply wrinkled from decades of quilting. Canning, washing collective tons of clothing. clothing. And, black and black cast iron pots. The southern memory is of generations of life. Of the good and the bad, the humor and the suffering from the past. The southerner does not sentimentalize, but only remembers. Something that doesn't sentimentalize. Man, we, we sentimentalize all the time. <laughs> I mean, I don't know where he's going with that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, much of this out is about sentiment, sentimentality. <laughs>